I want to um, express myself, the cathedral helps us to, so we need to change space um, to um, have a different reason in terms of how we walk. Yes, please. How do you deal with the accelerated rate of change? Um, the accelerated rate of change, um, the way we've been dealing with it is that we have had to work more in teams and community. That for the individual, the rate is very fast. But as a collective, we can actually begin to manage that um, pace much better. That apart from ourselves, uh, that's all we have. I mean, it's like we, and we'll use technology to augment what we're doing, but a combination of the tools and the human system, uh, which um, Doug Engelbert was one of those pioneering that we must co-evolve our tools and our human system. So one of the things I like um, is when I look at some of the military formations, different formations dealt with different skills of war, warfare, and that um, the information that we're really collecting now, um, there are a number of ways of dealing with it. One other thing to mention, a few years ago, I watched a movie where the, uh, an autistic child, um, he was probably about 14 years old, was flown over London for five minutes. After five minutes, they asked him to draw. And he drew the landscape with so much detail. So these are not pathologies. The autistic person is able to draw in much more information <laughs> more than all of us. But it needs somebody else to complement his lack of social skills to bring that ability. So our diversity as a human race is an adaptive mechanism. But if we don't use and say, oh, he's disabled, let's know of no value, then we won't deal with scale because we'll have formed everybody into what's normal <laughs> and not be able to tap the extremities. So I tend to see my basic philosophy is that we're all mad. We lie along a spectrum of madness, and, but that we can join our madness together to deal with um, the challenges we face. Um, so I think that's a very, and you know, earlier in the morning people sort of spoke about um, um, our feminine energy. Um, part of empathy and sensitivity is the feminine energy. Um, and that's one of the things that we emphasize that um, we do have the capacity to sense each other. Um, the military does a good job when they, in the training, the, the um, Navy SEALs, um, they, that they are very sensitive to each other's position in, in defending a territory. Um, so those are, um, so I would say our diversity has a, an enormous potential for managing the scale that we're at. And when I go to some, um, maybe to mention one thing, Part of the research which came out of London um, by Simon Baron Cohen showed that about 20% of people with autism came from parents who are scientists and engineers. And so if you go to a culture in which, and by some luck because of this First and Second World War, we learned to use those autistic people in cracking code, the enigma and those, and people will say, oh, they don't have social skills. But the problem is, if you go into other societies that have not fought a war, they feel these autistic people are not socially okay. So they've not supported their own autistics. So when I go to countries, I say, where are your autistic people? <laughs> we need them to manage the change. Because they've been stuffed, you know, stashed away because they didn't have the requisite social skills. Um, so I think it's that spectrum that we can harness. Um, and so that's a fantastic question that we have to re recover. We sort of thought technology made us free and individualistic, and then we start to have problems and need to know that we need to begin to work together. Okay. The Gestalt, yes. Um, let's go into this room. Um, I mentioned this yesterday, that this was the room for presentation, but it was also the room for drama, for acting plays. Um, because I can ask the question now, um, what will the world be like in 2050? And we can dream. Um, there's a quote I'm trying to remember where I got it from, um, old men dream dreams and young men see visions. But when we visualize that future, we can act it out because drama is the engineering of emotions. As an engineer, I engineer energy, but the director and producer of a play are engineering emotions and we can play out 
doesn't cost a lot. That's also very good. <laughs> like we can play out different scenarios of the future and decide what we feel about that scenario. What do we feel about this other play? And in real time, we can say, OK, that's the future. And we can ask questions about the drama. What if that child over there was my son now? And you can imagine your son in 20 years out. So drama and um, Hollywood um, begin to help us project um, that our collective imagination because they're tapping into our consciousness. We tend to be collective because we're all really trying to survive <laughs> as species on this earth. Um, so it brings in a very important element in stimulating our imagination. Um, so in the interest of time, I'll keep moving and we'll go further down. So one of the questions I was asked is if there is, could you ask your question? Yeah. Well, I was asking if there's anyone here working in, in the area of parenting that is really addressing, in the digital age, we have a very different quality of parenting happening in terms of emotion and empathy. Okay. And, and is there any work being done, research being done, and how to bring empathy back in in a different way? Okay. So my answer is, I actually don't know. Okay, but the way the classes are is that if somebody cares a lot about that and pulls around another set of students around them, they make it happen. So a few years ago, somebody said, well, why are you teaching this to just graduate students? Um, we think people in K through 12 should learn about it. Okay, that's K through 12 laboratory. So a few schools have started to take the techniques here into K through 12. I mentioned earlier the person who said, why don't we use this method for... Um, journalist and there's a program downstairs he found some money and they're doing there they have a lab so it's um, the the notion that in the university you have access to different areas of knowledge and the students are really like pulling bees because they can call up this professor and call up that professor the professors don't have as much time to network but the students have a lot of time so um, by giving them the space to do it it becomes very, very critical. So I don't know, I can find out if somebody has done on parenting, but they, 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 this particular building started in two trailers when they started. Um, we got a $30 million gift from Hasso Platner, the, and, and he said, I want to see this happen. And the university said, we don't have any space, um, but do you want to use this trailer? And we started in the trailer, just two small trailers. And it's 10 years later that you see this. But we went through four different spaces. And each space, we kept on trying something new. And we're now tired because we think if you move us through spaces, um, it forces us to change our minds about this. So always start small, and it gets bigger. Is there, is there next step that you're working on? Yeah, we're looking for a next step. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's the next step. <laughs> um, you can come in here then. Um, so this is the um, rapid prototyping room, um, both digital prototyping and um, fiscal prototyping. And the idea here is that more than anything, as humans, we think more with our fingertips than our, any other thing. So when you look at babies, they keep picking things up and putting them out, and we still have that ability. Um, so at this lab, um, two things happen. Between the thinking space and the doing space, the proximity is small. That way, as you have a thought, you can easily prototype it. The material also allows me to express an idea. I don't need to be an engineer to use this material. And already, I'm conceptualizing what I want. Um, words are great tools, but world, um, words are great tools, but words are also prisons. Um, the words we use can imprison us. So you have to always look for alternative means of expressing an idea. The word can be misunderstood. It will have taken on new connotations and denotations. It's just, but if I say, this is what I really mean, a bowl. Now, <laughs> everybody gets that. They can see it, they can feel it, they can do it themselves. Um, several years ago, I was the TA um, teaching assistant for one of the classes. And the fire marshal came and said, you shouldn't have all these tools here. 
the tools need to be over there. You know, he assigned a different place, which was like 100 meters away. Um, people stopped making things. Because when I make, if I have an idea, and I said, now to make it, I have to travel another 100 meters. Uh, it wasn't a good idea anyway. Oh, because we're trying to conserve our energy. That is so true. <laughs> okay, so anything you want, keep them proximally related, and interesting things happen. But if it's too far, we, we don't like to expend energy for, and the idea might not work, you see. It's just an idea I quickly had. But once I have the idea, and it looks a bit stupid to me, Somebody else nearby says, no, Adi, just add this, and boom. So failure can go from failure to success almost instantaneously when we are together. Whereas if it was just myself looking at it, then I don't have a different point of view on it. And my own point of view says it doesn't work, it has failed. Whereas someone else with a different point of view says, ah, 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 ah. I knew of, and the big experiment that I always just delights me was... Um, when Einstein was asked, when, after he made his um, discovery of the um, um, uh, theory of relativity, he was asked, OK, when will it be that humans will be able to split an atom? And he said, um, I don't think for another 100 years. But he didn't know that there were some scientists in Berlin who all they were waiting for was his own equation. <laughs> you know, and by the, by the confluence of war, where we had to force the scientists to all come together, the atomic bomb was built um, less than 100 years after the key equations were going. So the ideas, and I think this whole franchise has brought together people from really different walks of life together in realizing the potential is there, except we've not connected it. And so that's a very, very key aspect. Uh, so we'll continue. Could I ask one question? Yes, please. It seems to me that uh, you're talking about proximity. Here you're talking about physical proximity. Proximity. Yes. But uh, digitalization has reduced the proximity of information from user to almost nothing. Uh, example, when I was an undergraduate, I was constantly seeing things that I would like to read. But in order to read it, I had to modify my schedule, go to the library, find it in the card index, go to the, the rack, and of course, often found it was gone. Yes. And so then you have to sign up for it. And so it takes you six weeks to get to it. Yes. Six weeks later, I have no idea why I wanted it. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. <laughs> yeah. I'm just wondering if that's part of what is happening here. Because, uh, and you didn't mention three dimensional printing and the development of prototypes. But there's a lot of prototypes now that are being produced by three-dimensional printing at a cost ratio of 1 to 100. Yes. Um, so we do have uh, three several three it, It's sort of become just part of the fabric. So there's three-dimensional printing, which allows the prototyping to be done much faster. Um, one thing to say about the information is that now that we have a lot of information, and in the past a lot of countries said, oh, the challenge to our development is R&D. The internet is now available. And you'll find that the challenge to development is trust. Right. It, it's moved. That before we thought it was, OK, what you mentioned, it takes about six weeks to get this information. Now we have information. The breakdown is occurring in terms of trust, because um, trust is fundamental to how we work together. And so we need new social um, contracts, ways of doing contracts. We need new ways to build trust. Um, that is more equitable. So it has moved where we thought was our problem, getting access to information, which it was. We've now had to begin to deal with trust and how to get a team to work together over a length of period. It's not if we just work together one day, OK, that's OK. But if you have to work over three years together and remain committed to a goal and also be able to shift the goals, it begins to test a lot of our agency in terms of how we work together. So we'll see some of our 3D printers, but we know that the technology, and I think one example of that is for China to raise 600 million people out of poverty in 20 years, 
um, was phenomenal. And that's because our technology now, speaking as an engineer, making things is like photocopying. Um, injection molding allows you to produce parts. Um, 3D modeling is going to go faster, but we know that's no longer where the choke point is. Um, that the choke point is human trust. Um, but the technologies are there to really, it's, it's photocopying. Um, and you know, we used to accuse Japan of copying Detroit. It's really become, with China, the photocopying is also, it's just, okay. So how do we build trust? And so that becomes the key thing. And some of the projects I'm working on now um, is looking at um, financial capital and moral capital. That the regulatory framework creates a feedback loop. And regulation, which is how we make laws, and financial capital is how we make capital through the property laws, which converts our assets into capital. Those are broken. And the feedback loop is moving just um, because we're moving. Before we had derivatives in the financial market, the money we made, which was extra capital, we tended to reinvest it in the community. Now I can have the same pot of money, and should I reinvest or should I put it into securities? Securities is guaranteed by government. I'm pretty much comfortable with that, so I don't reinvest. So gradually, money is being pulled out of the real economy into the derivatives economy, and we're saying, oh, we're poor, we're poor. Well, the regulation is broken. Um, and as an engineer, I know if I turn the pipe the other way, <laughs> you get the money flowing back. So with poor regulation, we get um, an ecosystem that begins to die. Um, but again, capitalism helped us to get out of fear. Um, it helped us um, do a few wonderful things. But um, sometimes we go a bit too far, and then we need to re-regulate the system. So it's all design. Re a regulator or lawmaking, it's about it's law, writing law. And we do it very well as humans, and we've been doing it for quite a while. Um, so I think these different systems, um, we can begin. And one of the things we've done with software engineers, we remind them that it's not symbolic. So we begin to do software and say, OK, this is what you mean. And this is the other law. And so where we move, so we begin to practice law physically. Because you don't get. Um, you will, will understand it very intuitively. Um, but if we have to say, OK, here's all the words and the rest, and then we confuse ourselves and obfuscate things. But this is what you mean. This is what I mean. <laughs> OK. So we draft the law physically. And, that, and that's how we built airplanes. In, the, in those days, we'll have a big drawing of a complicated airplane. I could make a whole complicated constitution, put it out. So people can see it, and we can watch it together and begin to see what we are meaning. As long as we have made a commitment to be transparent. If we don't want to be transparent, uh -huh, then don't make it physical and let's talk. I mean, you have to know what you want to do. Um, if we want to build an airplane, don't make it transparent. And then we know it's a hiding game. Um, but if you, um, for any group of people who want to be transparent, there are devices that allow us to be transparent to bring our interest on the table, and to rewrite or remake the things we've written. Um, so the internet has given us really the, a way of doing that. And I think um, as we're thinking, rethinking design, um, it's become quite um, evident that, yes, we need a re reimagination of who we are in this world. OK, so interest of time. Yeah. We, I'm sorry, to, but we can't. We, we lunch. We start yes. in half an hour, the next speaker. Yes. So the project are work done by students, a group of three or four students here, and three or four students in Brazil, in Sweden, in whatever the country is. These are all graduate students, so they have their first degree. And so it's a, um, it's a, it's a deal for the company, getting engineers to work at that rate. But they have to work on the problem, and they're trying to build the aircraft in 20, do you know the year? For the new aircraft. <laughs> okay. <laughs> There's a target time. Um, but what is happening here is that you're seeing a pre-competitive sharing of information. Um, an idea can go from the aircraft industry into um, the automobile or into healthcare. Um, we had a project from the um, UNICEF last year on looking at um, drugs for children, drug delivery. So ideas are moving back. And remember, uh, the critical thing about Silicon Valley is that it's using a lot of its young population in its innovation. Most of the people, OK, because they have time. 
some of these people sometimes they I used to be a student in this class. We may work for eight hours. And our bodies can take 48 hours of pounding. <laughs> okay, but now if I work 48 hours, I'm <laughs> okay. So the ideas are moving here, and the companies all have a liaison. So there's a back and forth between the companies and the students. And um, by the time they present in June, it, it's fantastic. Uh, my project was for Lockheed, for example, and we had to then go to talk to the um, Lockheed management. And it was interesting because I was no longer really functioning as a student. I was really a, an engineer consulting to them, but I was a student all along. But, so that notion that our students can actually do more than we give them credit for is very important. And what we've done is to create an environment where they are able to um, really generate potential far beyond our um, expectation. Um, there are some things we do in terms of the teaching but it's really very, uh, this class convinced me. I used to work about five years in industry before I came back to school. I said the difference between working in this class and working in ELF, it was a French company, was that I didn't have to play the politics of the company. So I was more efficient and more creative as an engineer here than in the company. And things got done much quicker. Okay, let's keep moving. <laughs> so welcome to the design observatory. Um, the, what we do here is we observe engineers and designers solving problems. Um, our goal was to, in the initial phase, um, the, this lab was set up um, in the, well not this lab, but this research program was set up in the 80s um, because Japan had outcompeted the US in the automobile industry and they had also taken over the um, electronics industry. And the National Science Foundation said, what are we going to do? And industry said, what are you folks in universities giving us? The engineers are not cutting it. And that was because we had um, the curriculum in engineering had been changed in 1960, more or less, after Sputnik, to focus on the Cold War. And Japan was never allowed to um, rebuild their military after the Second World War. So they focused a lot of their talent on the civilian population. And so we discovered um, that, in fact, what had happened was we were building a set of engineers for the Cold War era, but the world had moved on. And um, that's how we lost in the automobile. So we had to focus on what is the essence of engineering. And some people said it was design. And um, so we had, but we had lost how we did design. It was done organically. And we built Detroit and all that. It was just people figuring things out. And so we had to restudy how does design happen. And, and so we um, had um, used a lot of video cameras to observe the interaction process while people are building things. And through that process, we began to learn um, the basics of design. Um, part of it, I'll just give you a few ideas just in 10 minutes of time. In the early stage of design, engineers use a lot of gestures. Why? Because what they're trying to build doesn't exist. It doesn't have a name. So you, okay, and in some earlier literature, people had thought, oh, engineering is like playing chess. Well, except that in chess, the pieces are already formed, and you know what the rules are. Um, but if you don't know what the future is, um, we get back to how babies learn. <laughs> Where do you want to go? Um, so we learned that, and we also saw that um, the teams, part of the studies, quite a lot of studies, showed that the teams that did well were the teams that... Um, were able to invent new language. So if you ask me, what have we created in the US between 1960 and today? Well, take the dictionary in 2010, subtract it from dictionary in 1960, you get a fair amount of sense of what we have invented. So if I asked you in 1960, what's a mouse? You'll say, oh, it's a rodent. <laughs> if I ask you today, um, which mouse do you mean? The computer mouse or the, okay, so the mouse um, became, and so we began to track that language. Um, if I told you a word, three-legged semiconductor device for switching, mm -hmm. that's the transistor. But when you see the engineers making it, they call it a three-legged one mm -hmm. for making, because or it, there must be, have been a two-legged one that didn't work, and a <laughs> three-legged one worked. So there's a difference between what you see here when we are making mm -hmm. and what you see outside when we are selling. Nobody will sell a three-legged semiconductor device for switching. Do you want to buy my three-legged semiconductor? Yeah. Okay. So in language, we will concatenate and try to get a more emotive name. 
But there's a difference between the marketing of engineering and the doing of engineering. And what we study here is the doing, the, the making process. It's the same thing that you find in law, that the different criteria for making a law is different from what we see printed out. And except you go back into the kitchen and see what the interactions are in producing that law, um, you'll be more or less following the law. But it has a lot of its caveats. And so in engineering, all those caveats and the failures and the alternative paths we tried um, come out in it. So we must always, the key thing here is to remain flexible. We got stuck because we now said, now that we can do design, what other aspects of design can we do? And um, several years ago, I was approached by some people that they wanted me to do venture design. Can we create new ventures? Because it's a product and it's a venture. We also now sell ventures. We sell products, we sell ventures. And I said, well, in engineering, we focus a lot on energy. In venture, what are the components of venture? And I said, storytelling. Um, that we have political entrepreneurs, good storytellers, they get, okay. So a venture is a social movement. Okay, it could be an entrepreneurial social movement, it could be political, but those people that have social movement um, talk. So a politician talks and we resonate with what he's talked. Now, we then started to study storytelling um, because it has its structures. And now the same story that works in Russia will not work here because people have been imprinted with different types of stories. So we need to understand the imprinting. But what, is, what we found was that the story has to be able to grab the people at the gut and they'll move. And as we began to study that, we found that in fact key to that was about emotions. So we borrowed from the work of um, John Gottman. Um, he was in, um, he's in yeah. Seattle. And they studied, um, because it was the most basic human team it's the couple in a marriage. And he's been studying marriages. And he studied over 2,000 couples and was able to predict the ones that will divorce with about a 94% accuracy in his prediction. So he said, OK, we are looking at teams. We'll adopt his method for a couple and put it on. We tend to work on three to four person teams in engineering. Um, so this is from Ekman's work, looking at different emotions. So when we started to do that research, we will bring the video much closer to look at the real-time emotion of the team walking. Because if you have to get to trust, it's an emotional feeling. If I don't trust you, I say, I don't quite know what is with you, <laughs> but something, my belly doesn't feel comfortable. And so we started studying the emotion of engineers. And uh, um, what Gottman had done was by using, i just briefly tell you what the text was and I'm summarizing, but he'll give them a neutral topic. So the couple will talk. Then he'll give them a contentious topic and see how they go at it. And it's how they go, so I've taken, taken their base point and I've now taken how they handle conflict. And based on that change, he was able to make his predictions. So one of our students took the same thing and said, listen, just give me 15 minutes of watching the team and I want to be able to tell you something about their performance. And it turns out that we actually store a lot of emotional information. We're just not conscious of it. Um, and he was able to replicate Gottman's work with a um, pair programming team. And he was able to account for 35% of the success based on emotions alone. Um, so emotion, language, which are a lot of the tools we use as humans to navigate, are some of the things we're now building up. Um, and we're looking at both um, the design of the product, engineering design. We're looking at the design of the organization, which is a venture design. We're looking at the design of the investment scheme because we design investment instruments, um, financial instruments to achieve certain purpose. And the design of the market. Uh, a market is a manifestation of human interaction as a much bigger scale. So when we can design those four components, we can in fact look at the rudiments of what we'll call the Silicon Valley. That it's a place where there's a flow in all these design metaphors. And I think what Silicon Valley was able to do, I don't know the reason, sometimes I attribute it to the drug culture, but, <laughs> but they allowed these four elements of design to work together. The academia in Stanford and its relationship to industry. Um, so the flow is a very critical component to us because for us, money is made, wealth is made when there's flow. And as the flow becomes faster, it broadens out and includes a lot of people. 
As we lose confidence, the flow begins to lose steam, and then just a few. So we know that the emotion is the energy used in, in uh, and our laws have to be written in a way that allows flow. Um, if it blocks flow, it will limit growth. And speaking of flow, we really should get to lunch. <laughs> yes, and I just finished. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> I never...